and the first talk will be by Nai Tian, and he'll be talking about improving dialogue agents with a social dimension. So go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Emily. Um, yeah, so like Emily said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the project that I've been working on this summer, uh, which is improving dialogue agents with uh, the sort of like social dimension. Um, so yeah, so I guess like the, the first question is like, what is the dialogue problem, right? And um, in principle, it's pretty simple, right? So like someone says something and the question is, how do you respond, right? And sometimes, you know, it's pretty easy. So if someone says hello, uh, you should probably greet them back. Right. Um, other times it's not so simple. Right. So like conversations are very rarely self-contained. Um, they might reference the outside world. It's like, what if the weather wasn't that good? Right. Then you, you know, you'd say something different or they might like talk about, um, they might depend on like individual characteristics of each speaker. So like, you know, what if I burn very easily in the LA sunshine? Right. So uh, maybe then the weather also isn't that good. Um, they might depend on higher level attributes like to what extent am I willing to participate in this conversation, right? Or social relationships, right? Like the way that uh, Alex and I converse would be very different if Alex were my boss versus my friend versus, um, you know, my, my father or something, right? Um, and so all of these different things, um, all of these different factors combine to kind of condition the way that we approach dialogue. And so the dialogue problem is basically like, how do we condition a dialogue agent to respond based on you know x y and z of these different factors um the basic way to approach this is we kind of collect a dialogue corpus right um that pays special attention to like some or all or none of these features um and we perform supervised learning to kind of see um like what should i say next right and hopefully the end result is we have this um interesting uh but consistent dialogue um and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we can and why maybe we should approach dialogue as uh, an improv comedy problem, right? Um, and then we'll talk a little about, about prior work and the dimensions of dialogue. And then I'll jump into the social dimensions of dialogue, which is kind of um, what this project has been. And then finally, I I'll wrap up with uh, the next steps for this project. Um, so there's a pretty good reason to kind of imagine dialogue as improv comedy. Um, it's, it's, it's predicated around this idea that like in improv comedy, uh, the entire scene or the entire like conversation, right, is self-contained. And so the assumptions about our knowledge about the outside world are loosened. Um, and so, you know, uh, we can, the, the goal in improv is to like kind of build up this world inside of the conversation. Um, and so, uh, with like chit chat dialogue agents, um, that's, we're kind of trying to do the same thing, right? Like we don't assume um, anything about the other person, right? We, do, we try to build it up from scratch. Um, and so like one of the main things that we want to try to establish with improv is like a set of uh, characteristics of this world that we're building, right? So first we want to like set up a location and then an action and then a relationship, right? Um, and so we're like especially interested in relationship for uh, our purposes because unlike location and action, relationship is a little more intangible, right? And so, um, you know, uh, location, it's, it's some place, action, it's something that you're doing. Relationship, well, that's a bit harder to define, right? And it has like, uh, I'd say it has like greater um, effects on like how you actually interact with someone else, right? Um, and so uh, like the, the main question then is like, how can we use this sort of like relationship or social information to kind of um, affect how we uh, converse, right? Or how our dialogue agent converses. Um, so uh, to go back a little bit, I guess, before we talk about how we incorporate social uh, dimension, it's good to like think about how other people have incorporated other dimensions of dialogue into conversational agents, right? Um, so for example, um, there's this idea of external knowledge and grounding. So like we want to build this common understanding of the world. Uh, and so, you know, Justin um, and John had recently published a paper uh, for using like yes ands um, from improv uh, to kind of 
uh, encourage grounding conversations, right? Um, so uh, the, basically like the corpus there was these um, yes and examples from this um, improv podcast, right? And you perform supervised learning on that corpus and you get this model that uh, tries to incorporate more grounding into the conversation. Um, and, and so, and so like the other, other two things that I cited here um, are kind of just formal models of uh, grounding. Um, then there's like this idea of low level self-knowledge. So kind of like dating profile information, right? So like, what are your likes, what are your dislikes? Um, this was proposed by um, uh, a group from Stanford in 2016 and then like popularized by um, the release of the Persona Chat data set in 2016 um, from Facebook AI, I think. And so uh, the idea here is like, you know, um, what you know of yourself actually like impacts the conversation a lot, right? So like if I ask what do you like, then you should be able to tell me what you like. And if I ask you again, you should be able to like not contradict yourself, right? Or like if I ask you or your age twice, you should give me the same number back twice, right? Um, and so this is like kind of conditioning on this low level type of self-knowledge. So uh, this data set, you have like this collection of personas for each of the participants, and then they kind of construct a conversation um, incorporating those facts about themselves. Um, there's also the idea of like high level self-information, right? So um, this is from uh, this Aloha paper. So uh, automated learning of human level attributes uh, uh, from this group, at, I think Toronto. And basically uh, instead of like these sort of like dating profile types of information, like what are your likes and dislikes? It's more like literary analysis information, right? So they look at like um, uh, character tropes from TV tropes, uh, like a website that analyzes like uh, fictional characters, right? And um, they coordinate that with like um, TV show dialogue, right? And so uh, given these things as their personas now, um, can we like condition people or can we condition a dialogue agent to um, converse based on these like higher level attributes, right? Um, so it's less like uh, uh, I like Cheetos and more like I'm an insufferable genius, right? It's a different level of knowledge. Um, so with that said, uh, we wanted to focus on the social dimension now, right? And so uh, to focus on the social dimension, uh, we have to um, first like find a corpus, then second, we want to define what status is right that we want to be looking at. Um, third, we want to measure status, and fourth, we want to like actually model status, right? So uh, the idea of status is like you know um, people can have high status or low status, and this impacts like um, relative to other people, right? And this impacts the way that they interact and what they say and what they do. So to find a corpus, um, we first like looked at social power corpora. Uh, so like the Enron uh, email corpus um, and the Supreme Court uh, transcriptions corpus. Uh, and so these were nice because they had like this, um, they, they had like a, a, a natural like um, hierarchy already associated with them. So like with Enron, you already have like these org charts, right? Which say like, well, this person reports to that person, that person reports to that person, this person's the CEO, right? Um, with the Supreme Court data set, you know, you, you can assume that like uh, the Supreme Court justices, for example, are of higher status than the clerks, right? Um, the big issue is that, um, first of all, these aren't very conversational, right? So uh, Enron, again, their emails, right? Um, Supreme Court, most of these are like prepared statements, right? Um, and also they focus on this like external hierarchical aspect of power. Um, and we wanted to focus on this more um, immediate uh, sense of power. And I'll expand on that a little bit later. Uh, and so instead we decided to look at dialogue corpora, right? So we looked at the call home corpus, which is this um, kind of small data set of uh, manually transcribed long distance phone calls. Um, we looked at the Cornell movie dialogues corpus um, and we looked at the Gutenberg book dialogues corpus. Um, call home, initially promising, uh, 
but it, we found out that you know most of these calls were to like um, close friends or family, and so uh, there wasn't a great diversity in uh, relationships, and also uh, you know there there was a very little signaling of status that was going on in these conversations. Um, Gutenberg, because it's like a narrative uh, dialogue data set, right? Um, it's more likely to contain these sort of like uh, uh, character relationship signaling uh, features in the dialogue, right? Uh, the issue was that, you know, Gutenberg is open domain, public domain books, so they're pretty old. And so the dialogue is actually pretty archaic. Um, so uh, we ended up with Cornell uh, as what we built off of because, you know, it's relatively modern, it's pretty big, and it also has by virtue of being uh, movie scripts, right? Um, like stronger character relationship signals. Um, and so the next step was, you know, how should we define status, right? Um, and so the first thing that we tried was, you know, just broadly defined, uh, annotate like a handful of dialogue pairs and see, see if we get any sort of agreement, right? Like maybe everyone already knows what status is and we don't actually have to formally define it. Um, that didn't work very well. And so we ended up with like a Cohen's cap of 0.2, which is not very high. Um, and so we thought maybe we should go back into theory and actually look at um, what's going on. And so going into like social psych theory, um, there's this concept of social power, which is pretty relevant to our idea of status, right? Um, but we actually wanted to uh, be a little bit more specific. And so there's like a couple of constraints that we're uh, interested in. And so the first is that, uh, we care about these dyadic interactions, so between two people only and not within a larger group, right? Um, the second thing is we want to care about immediate power. So like the power located in um, a single interaction as opposed to like um, an overarching range of interactions. So what does this mean? It means like take this example where we have like this um, CEO that's going, uh, that wants a table at a restaurant, right? And so the CEO wearing the top hat says, you know, I want a table for two. And uh, the maitre d says, sorry, there are no more tables open, right? And so you can think that, you know, CEOs probably have like a higher status socially in the external world. Um, but uh, in this uh, interaction, localized to this interaction, actually the maitre d has a lot of um, power, right? Because, uh, you know, the CEO wants something and the maitre d has the power to deny uh, the CEO that. Right. Um, and on the other hand, uh, it's not, it, it's not that like the fact that he's a CEO doesn't matter, right? You can imagine like, you know, if we have some like vagabond that comes off off the streets and like says, I'd like a table for two, then maybe the Vader D's reaction would be a little bit different, right? And so that points to the fact that there's like multiple dimensions to social power and all of them kind of play a part into the final dynamic of an interaction. And so we really have to look at like, what are these different parts of social power and how do they fit together? Um, and so, yeah, dimensions of social power. Uh, so looking into theory, um, the, the first thing that we saw is like this uh, French and Raven uh, paper from 1959 that uh, deposits like five bases of social power. And I'm not a huge fan of um, them saying they're like five bases of social power because you know the math basis is like a set of orthogonal vectors and I think like these aren't exactly orthogonal um, which I'll talk about a little bit later too um, but they you know they give like these five types of power right and so the first is like reward power right so um, you know the John is my boss right and so he uh, can choose to pay me right and so uh, I am inclined to do what he says right um, uh, the other side, the other end of the stick is that, you know, there's coercive power, so uh, he can also choose to, like, fire me. And so I'm also inclined to do what he says because of that, right? Um, there's legitimate power, right? So, like, he has high societal status, so, you know, he's a professor, I'm an intern. Um, <laughs> uh, so he has, like, higher, higher status um, in, like, the USC or, like, the academic community, and so I'm inclined to do what he says, right? Um, <laughs> there's, like, refer referent power, which is, like, um, Kind of like influence so like others want to align with you uh so like you know um again john is uh well respected i think in in this community right and so like i i want to get closer to john i want to like um align with him and so i'm willing to do what he wants me to do right 
Um, finally, there's like expert power, which is like knowledge in a needed field. So like uh, John knows stuff about NLP. Uh, and so um, I, and, and so, you know, he, he knows a lot about NLP and like research. And so if he tells me something um, in one of our meetings, you know, I'm inclined to like believe him and do it. Right, so like five dimensions of social power. Uh, as exp as exemplified by my internship summer. Um, on, the, on the other hand, like I, I can also have reward power, right? So like um, John wants results and I, I have control over whether he gets those results, right? So um, in that respect, I also hold some of the power. Okay, uh, so again, this was in 1959, so nothing computational there. Uh, so we also looked at like computational approaches and so this uh, Probacharan paper from 2012 offers like this taxonomy for computational model, which they um, annotated the Enron data set with. Uh, and so they, they like whittled it down a little bit. And so they proposed like situational power, power over communication, hierarchical power and influence. So situational power, they say is like the, uh, being able to direct or approve someone's actions. Um, so this is pretty similar to like reward and coercive power together. Um, so like in this example, right, uh, B has situational power over A because A is looking for answers, right, and B uh, can either like uh, accommodate that request or reject it, right, and so B has situational power. Um, same thing with the CEO and the mater D. The mater D can reject the CEO's request for a table, and so they have the situational power. Uh, the second thing is power over communication, which is, uh, you can think of it as control of the conversation. Um, so like uh, uh, in this case, like A has control of the conversation, right? A is asking the questions, B is just trying to react. Um, there's hierarchical power, which is the boss employee relationship, right? So like uh, who contains like the um, higher social status, right? Or like um, in French and Raven's terms, the legitimacy, right? Um, so in this case, you know, sergeant outranks private. And so uh, B has the hierarchical power and A does not. Finally, there's this idea of influence, which is kind of like the referent power. It's having this credibility in the group, uh, which is pretty hard to determine in dialogue. Um, it, it's kind of like this thing that you, you see emerge in like a, a social situation, right? Um, and, and so like in, in the Enron data set, basically they give this example of um, like Sarah uh, asks for advice, right? Um, and uh, after Mark uh, expresses his view, she like concurs with him, right? So like in this case, Mark has influence over Sarah. Um, so because like influence is kind of hard to measure, we, for our like own simplified taxonomy, uh, we kept like the situational power and the communicative power, and then we kind of bundled the rest of it together into this uh, external power, right? So like what power exists kind of outside of this immediate interaction um, that we can like kind of point to. Um, and, and this taxonomy definitely has flaws, which I'll talk about a little bit later when we're like looking at annotation results. So now the big question is, can we actually expect to annotate for social power and to do it successfully, right? Um, uh, can we actually measure social power? And the answer is like, yes, <laughs> right? So we set up this um, annotation task uh, with a sample of 40, uh, three, three turn pair dialogues, right? So each person speaks three times. Um, and so John and I went through these and annotated uh, several rounds over. Um, and, and so like we wanted to look at situational, communicative and external power and like this overall uh, sense of power, right? Um, and so these are the results. Uh, the agreements are much better than before. Um, if you'll recall before the uh, kappa was like 0.2 and so now the lowest is 0.36. Um, so definitely better and it points to the fact that like there is some signal uh, that social power manifests manifests itself in dialogue, right? You can like, you, you can you can tease it out a little bit. Um, uh, the external power, the big discrepancy is that I was a lot more conservative conservative than John and assigning anyone the power, right? So I have a lot of like can't tells that John actually like uh, gave to someone or the other. Um, uh, I was actually a little bit surprised by how high the overall power 
uh, agreement was, um, considering that we never actually defined what overall power is, right? We just say like, you know, the, the idea is that overall power is some uh, combination of the first three, right? And so we're interested in seeing, you know, having like uh, an annotation for overall power, we can see like how uh, these three different types of power can interact with each other and, um, and, and, and kind of combine to make up for like this overall sense of power that we get, uh, like this overall power dynamic in a dialogue. Um, the, the other implication is that we can actually like kind of map out a social power space, right? So like uh, given that we have like these three types of power, you can see like, well, who has what type of power in an in interaction, right? And so we can look at all of these different combinations, right? Um, so for example, AAA means that one person has all three types of dialogue, right? Um, alternatively, if you look at ABC, it means that one person has uh, situational, uh, another person has communicative power, and the last person, and, and like we can't tell who has the external power, right? Um, and so a little bit surprisingly to me, um, between the two of us, we actually cover 13 out of the 14 possible combinations uh, for the social power dynamics. Um, that said, uh, some are definitely a lot more frequent than others, right? So notably like AAC and ABC. So AAC is um, the same person has the situational and communicative power and you can't really tell for the last person. Um, ABC is different people have situational and communicative power and you can't really tell external. And then CAC is you can't tell situational or external, but uh, someone definitely has the communicative power. Um, and so like now we can like dig a little bit deeper into what each of these actually look like, right? And maybe there's like uh, trends associated with each of them. So like looking at ABC, these tend to be like interrogation scenarios, right? Uh, which makes sense because it's like one person is asking questions, uh, directing the conversation. So they have this communicative sort of control. Um, on the other hand, that also means the other person uh, gets to decide whether to actually provide answers, right? So they have power over uh, whether they actually want to answer this question. And so they have situational control. And so in this case, you can see, you know, um, A is through the interrogating, right? B is uh, distributing answers as they so choose. Um, AAC is kind of interesting. It's this like telling not asking dynamic um, where you can actually see like this distinction in power, right? So um like it means that one person is kind of like telling the other person um and the other person is like reacting it's like pretty reactionary and they lack the power so for example um you know uh here a2 um says like you're very kind i bet you're also very general and helpless and b2 is like what right <laughs> and so um uh, you know, A2 isn't asking for anything, but also like A2 has the power, right? Um, and they're in control of the con conversation. Um, finally, looking at like the CAC where like you don't have um, any like uh, situational power that we can tell, it's like this directed conversation where there doesn't exist this big power dynamic, um, but also like one person is driving the conversation forward, right? So here, um, so, so here like A is like talking to B, um, but there's, and like driving the conversation, right? B is mostly reacting, but also there's not like this um, power dynamic where like B, B has like any sort of power over A or A has any sort of power over B um, situational. So those are just like a couple of um, like, uh, I guess, archetypes that we found um, looking at this space. That said, there's like still some limitations with this uh, this taxonomy, right? And so from this like social power theory paper uh, from 2004, uh, they say like authority is predicted to increase with resources, right? So like situational power um, uh, and external power might be correlated, right? So then the question becomes like, well, to what extent is situational power just the manifestation of external power, right? Like does having external power just like give you license to use situational power, right? And so like these, these aren't entirely orthogonal measurements. Um, 
which makes the annotation a bit more difficult. And that's like one of the big things that like John and I have been having conversations about, about how to like clarify the annotations is like, how can you actually separate these things more? Um, I also briefly explored like all the alternatives to social power. Um, I won't go into these in depth because we didn't go into these in depth, uh, but like if you're interested, like uh, there's these uh, tangentially, there's like the idea of rapport building or formality in speech and also conversational style that are also like um, kind of social uh, dimensions to conversation. So the next steps, uh, we want to do annotation, right? Um, so doing turking, opening it up uh, to the world and like getting a large data set. Uh, and then we can start like modeling and answering some questions with this data. So like, you know, uh, for the first thing, why are multi-turn dialogues more informative, right? So like, uh, why, why do we do better with uh, three dialogue pairs instead of one? Is it because we're slowly incrementally building up this mental model of power until we can like reach a threshold and form a hypothesis? Or is it because it's just more likely that we'll find one turn pair that like gives us the answer, right? Um, can we actually model power dynamics in media? So like looking at TV shows or movies, can we like model those uh, power dynamics based on the dialogue? Um, you know, we should be able to, right? Because uh, that's kind of part of what literary analysis is, right? Um, the big question, can we condition a dialogue agent on power, right? And finally, you know, if we can condition a dialogue agent on power, can we condition power on dialogue, right? So like, can we kind of force social power dynamics by strategically picking out pieces of dialogue, right? Um, and so, you know, in summary, uh, dialogue problem, it depends on many different factors. Uh, we look at social relationships as an important factor in that. And we kind of show that social power does actually manifest itself in dialogue. Yep. And, and that's the summary. Thanks, Naintian. Um, are there any questions from anyone? We have a couple minutes before we should move on to the next talk. I'm not sure how to see the chat, so. Uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can just speak up or. Yeah. So I guess I have one question, which is, um, have you guys thought about power that changes in a conversation? Like maybe one person starts out with something, but it kind of morphs into something by the end of the something else into it by the end of the conversation and can your sort of like annotation scheme or what you're thinking about kind of model that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, that's that's another one of the challenges, right? Is like, what if one person has uh, like situational power now and then like it changes later? Um, you know, it, it's, I think it's hard to say. Um, I will say like, for the most part, we don't see that very often. Um, especially, we, you know, we have like relatively short dialogues. Um, so, you know, definitely, in longer dialogue, that's probably more likely to come up. Um, in a relatively short dialogues, uh, yeah, uh, the, we kind of just have to make a call. Uh, but you, you know, your question raises some interesting points because um, the uh, I think I have found at times I'm like, well, like you know, the one example that you, there's one example you gave where like the beginning of the conversation didn't look as much like a whatever AAC in the end did, um, and so. We could kind of think about the about uh, annotating with regard to like at the very next turn who do you expect will be, wh what do you think the control situations will be based on the last say in this case uh, six lines uh, and so because of course we're not annotating for the characters we're annotating for the lines that makes it a completely contextualized thing and thus able to be changed so i think if we just do a tiny little tweak where we, you know we're, we're trying to talk about the overall but if we if, if we, I mean, if we're able to convince, to be able to communicate this to Tookers that like, the question is really about that next line, right? Where where will the statuses be? Then that kind of like affords what Emily is uh, suggesting. Yeah. And, and I guess like with the, um, like if it is like incremental building, right? In terms of like how, how much does, like how does each dialogue turn play into it then, um, you know, I guess like there, there's a chance that like after three lines, it becomes more ambiguous than after like two lines, right? And um, yeah. Also, if you haven't seen the, there's like a social bias frames paper from UW. I think it's really relevant to your work. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was at ACL. Cool. All right. 
So if there are no other questions, then we'll move on to the second presentation. Cool, yeah, let me, let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, so I forgot to say that Naitan is a rising junior at the University of Michigan, and Omar is a, also a rising junior at uh, Georgia Tech. And so now he'll be talking about this presentation. Right, cool. So um, uh, can you all hear me? All clear? All right, cool. So hey, everyone. Uh, I'm an intern uh, working with uh, John. I'm also a rising junior at Tech. And uh, today I'll be covering like what I've looked at during my internship, understanding monolingual pre-training for bilingual models. So I want to start with a short overview for what I mean by uh, monolingual and bilingual models. So bilingual models refer to neural machine translation models where we have a source and a target and they're both in different languages. Monolingual models, on the other hand, just refer to using source languages for language modeling. So in this case, you're translating from French to English. This is a bilingual model. And in this case, you're just modeling English, you're just modeling uh, French. Uh, a more concrete example is uh, MBART. Uh, so it's still a monolingual model. It's trained on multiple languages. It can model English and it can model Spanish. So how are you, it would predict how are you, like how are would predict how are you, and como would predict como esta. There's no uh, intertwining um, between uh, these languages. So we still consider language models to be monolingual. Cool. So today what I'm going to be talking about are inherent differences between the representations in these monolingual models and these bilingual models in the context of neural machine translation. I'll also be posing reasons for why naively using these monolingual representations uh, from these language models to pre-train uh, these bilingual models doesn't yield improvements on uh, downstream translation tasks. Right, so here's a quick primer on uh, pre-training in NLP. So on a lot of downstream tasks like uh, sentiment analysis, uh, is this a happy or sad sentence or natural language inference, are these sentences contradictory or in, or in agreement? It's usually useful to kickstart your model with like an underlying knowledge of English before learning these more fine-grained tasks. So if you essentially pick up representations from large language models like BERT, or GPT, you can help provide this, uh, this knowledge at like the pre-training level. Instead of having the model learn it from scratch from like a smaller sentiment analysis data set or natural language inference data set. So the current uh, uh, naive pre-training methods uh, involve directly feeding these BERT representations into a downstream architecture. So this would be an MLP, a CNN, or an RNN, and then predicting your final uh, application. So this direct feeding uh, of uh, these embeddings is something I'll refer to as naive pre-training pre in the rest of this talk. It's a little surprising, but uh, there's just kind of a catch in this uh, naive pre-training method. It doesn't seem to universally apply to machine translation tasks. So if you directly initialize a machine translation models encoder with like BERT embeddings, or you directly feed these BERT embeddings as input, into uh, a machine translation encoder, you don't really see the same sort of um, uh, benefit. And we're not exactly sure like why this is the case because larger and more complicated language models have just continued to perform better on downstream tasks. It's so like a good example is the glue data set. Um, as these language models have gotten more and more complicated, you start, you just keep seeing an increase in uh, glue task performance. If we try these same embeddings for neural machine translation, on the other hand, we don't see the same sort of boost in like blue scores. So there are limited examples where naive pre-training does seem to help. And that's in supervised or, uh, I mean, unsupervised or low resource settings where you don't have that many um, English to German pairs, uh, for example. Uh, however, if you look at like a more resource rich, resource rich setting like WMT16, where you have like 4 million pairs, um, the, the benefit of BERT initialization isn't, isn't as clear. There are, however, more careful fine tuning methods that um, have been out for a bit and uh, they are able to yield um, 
uh, a more significant blue score improvement, but it's something we'll get into uh, later in this talk. Right, so just to center like uh, our, our big question, um, what I'm going to jump into surrounds this like overall topic. What intrinsic differences do neural machine translation or bilingual representations and large monolingual language models have that make this pre-training difficult? So uh, our first step is a bit of a detour. Um, I think to answer this over overarching question, me and John sort of agree that uh, it's better to look at what the translation models, encoders alone, or decoders alone are good at, and um, what the language models alone are good at. So if we understand their um, independent capabilities, maybe we can understand why careful pre-training or why just naive pre like initialization does or doesn't work. Right, so we decided to look into just probing representations across various language model setups and neural machine translation setups. Our probing setups are pretty similar to like most probing work. Uh, we just append a small classifier at the end of our pre-trained representations. This tiny classifier is trained on a more specific downstream linguistic task like POS tagging. Uh, the diagram on the right sort of shows the, the general setup. Um, and we pretty much did the same for NMT models too. So instead of a BERT model here, we uh, put an NMT model. So the kind of tasks I was looking for were basic linguistic tasks where we'd have large differences between monolingual and bilingual embeddings. So for example, where does BERT do better on, your, where does BERT do better compared to neural machine translation on these downstream tasks? So if we can pinpoint these areas, maybe we'll have a better understanding of why this pre-initialization isn't working. Uh, for these probing tasks, I kept my probes fairly simple. I just use a bilayer, like a multi, I just use a two layer multilayer perceptron. Uh, I kept the dimensions pretty low. Uh, I didn't want the probe to learn the task itself. I kind of wanted to um, extract the knowledge from the representations directly. Right, so I looked at a, pre a range of probing tasks, uh, parts of speech, syntactic arc dependency, tagging, semantic arc dependency. Syntactic arc prediction, semantic arc prediction, grammatical error detection, etc. So I'll quickly uh, go over what um, some of these tasks do. So the first one is fairly simple, just POS tagging. Uh, we essentially just label um, each word with whatever POS it, um, it has. We use the English Web Tree uh, English Web Tree Bank as their data set. So this task is fairly standard, and it was meant to probe for like um, a basic syntax inside these representations. Our next task is a little more interesting. So um, I found this probing task interesting because the underlying data set itself is derived from English as a secondary language exams. So this is taken from ESL exams. Overall, these questions seem to maintain like the semantics of the sentence. You get the general gist of the sentence, sentence's underlying meaning, regardless of whether you pick like the right answer or the wrong answer. So, in the morning, you're awakened or woken up by a puppy, by a or an singing puppy. Um, the overall meaning of the sentence remains the same. So it helps us identify like uh, downstream task performance for like a more fine grained uh, aspect of language. Uh, the last probing setup we used was syntactic or semantic arc prediction. So this probes a little bit for like higher order structure or pairwise relationships between tokens in a sentence. So specifically, we look for the existence of semantic arcs or syntactic arcs in the sentence. For semantic tasks, we use pen tree bank, and for syntactic tasks, we use the English web tree bank again. So you, you can think of semantic dependencies as like arcs that represent relationships of the type like who did what, to whom, how, and why, for events like referenced by like predicates in this sentence. Um, syntactic arcs are a little more specific. They're affected by um, the tone of a sentence if it's passive or active. Uh, so yeah. Um, so what we did is we tried two different tasks on uh, arc prediction. We tried classification. So can we figure out what kind of arc is expressed between uh, pairwise relationships? And prediction just is is simpler. Like is there is there exist is there an existence of some kind of arc between two tokens? Right, so the, the takeaway here is we introduced a bunch of probing tasks to look at what knowledge neural machine translation models or bilingual models have 
that monolingual models don't and vice versa. What linguistic tasks are monolingual models good at that bilingual models are not? Right, so now for the models we tested, we took a six layer NMT encoder from the trained on WMT14. So this is translation from English to German. And then we looked at a six layer decoder taken from WMT14. So uh, German to English uh, with the cross attention removed. So the general process for how we extracted these representations sort of goes as follows. Um, we took the encoder and just cut out the decoder and this would be an English to German translation model. So we're getting the English representations from um, this neural machine translation model. On the other hand, to get the decoder representations, we sort of just did the opposite. We severed the model in half, threw away the encoder and just removed the cross attention so the decoder would be standalone. In both of these cases, the takeaway is that we're still trying to extract representations from these large neural machine translation models and we're trying to isolate what areas of the, the translation model learns what. The monolingual models are a little more uh, straightforward. Um, we just took a, a six layer XLM mass language model. So trained on all of German and English Wikipedia. And then we took a six layer mini BERT model that was just trained on uh, all of the WMT14 data. So the same as the encoder and decoder. Our last model was a gigantic 24 layer BERT large case model. Um, it was trained on all of Wikipedia English along with book corpus, right? So here are the results. There are a lot of numbers, but we'll like jump into some of the surprising uh, takeaways. So first of all, the NMT encoder seems to put up a pretty good fight uh, against uh, BERT large, outperforming it on semantic prediction and syntactic prediction tasks. So my suspicion is that maybe the translation task itself requires a stronger identification of like is there a pairwise relationship between tokens or not? So yielding this result. This occurs despite the fact that the NMT encoder is trained on a lot less data, um, which is a little bit surprising. Um, again, even in the cases where BERT large does do better, the, the, the relative gap between the NMT encoder's performance on like POS tagging or semantic classification is quite small compared to the other um, uh, baseline models. So the, the key takeaways from uh, this analysis of uh, how, how the representations do are that these NMT encoders, like as contextualizers, are surprisingly data efficient. So despite being trained on only 4 million pairs instead of like 165 million examples, uh, the performance between BERT large and neural machine translation encoders are quite close. Um, the encoder performance is also close to BERT large which has a lot more data. Um, again, it's like 165 million uh, sentences compared to just four. Uh, it requires more train steps. Uh, the, our translation model was trained in like a day with four V100 GPUs, whereas uh, a larger BERT language model requires multiple days and like several TPUs. So another takeaway is that this might be helpful for lower resource contextualized representations. So if most of your data is just translation data um, and you're working on a very low resource language, so most of your, most of your resources come from uh, like Bible translations, perhaps it's more useful to take contextualized representations from a translation model instead of just from a monolingual model, right? Uh, there is something I kind of glossed over. I, I claimed that like NMT models are really good at a lot of things are they're, they're better than BERT, but there is there is a case where that's not necessarily true. I sort of hit it. Um, and that's grammatical error detection, the task where we're looking at, oh, are there small um, errors in the sentence that sort of make it grammatically incorrect? In this case, um, the NMT encoder performs a lot worse than BERT large. Uh, in fact, the NMT encoder is like worse than the other baselines too. So. Uh, it's a little surprising. Maybe like the language modeling objective itself uh, focuses more on grammar than the, the translation modeling objective. Uh, right, so this sort of highlights our next step from, this, from these, the results of these probing tasks. Um, we sort of have an idea of what these careful fine tuning methods do uh, to help with actually utilizing BERT. So 
naive pre-training methods, um, our hypothesis now is maybe naive pre-training methods um, don't really help much for grammar, whereas these careful methods uh, actually utilize um, the, the grammar knowledge in, for embeddings. Right, so I'm gonna jump into one of these specific um, uh, examples that actually, like one of these careful fine tuning examples that actually yield uh, uh, an increase in blue scores. So just to quickly summarize the way it works is you train a translation model from scratch. You don't introduce BERT to it at all. Then you fuse some BERT embeddings to every single layer from the source language to every single layer in uh, the translation model. So if you have a English to German translation model, you train that model from scratch, then you fuse English BERT embeddings to um, that translation model. And then you fine tune the model after that. So it's like a post um, augmentation of BERT onto these models. So essentially um, it, it ends up performing better uh, on uh, all, all like just WMT14. So we also added a scalar mix of BERT layers. So BERT NMT utilizes just the final layer of a BERT model. So we added a scalar mix to utilize all the layers and our blue scores increased by around 0.2. So we decided to keep it. So the takeaway from this is BERT NMT does some like interesting stuff where it kind of introduces BERT after you fully trained your NMT model. So you don't introduce BERT at all. You fully train your NMT model and then you use some knowledge from BERT at the very end to fine tune it. I, I hesitate to call this a pre-training method. It, it seems more of like an advanced fine tuning method um, uh, to me. Right, so our, our next hypothesis is that um, there is some, there's, this is like, like a more concrete reason for why BERT NMT uh, or this very careful fusing method avoids some of these problems and that's catastrophic forgetting. So essentially when you pre-train uh, a translation model on these monolingual embeddings, you start off with grammar knowledge and then you catastrophically forget um, the grammar knowledge. So this is sort of, this sort of gives a reason for why BERT NMT esque sort of techniques work. Um, you don't end up catastrophically forgetting the, the language you started with. Um, this hypothesis also supports why monolingual pre-training might help for low resource or unsupervised tasks. So for low resource tasks, you start off with grammar, but you have less data and less train steps. So therefore you forget less grammar. Um, so the BERT NMT paper doesn't explicitly mention this idea of catastrophic forgetting but we think they've sort of indirectly mitigated this problem. Uh, however, like what exactly is being catastrophically forgotten is still a little unclear, but currently our hypothesis is um, like this fine grained grammar knowledge. Cool, so we decided to run another smaller set of probing tasks on a subset of WMT14. Uh, and we looked at uh, the performance on downstream tasks again. So this is the original BERT large embeddings. Um, they're significantly better than the rest of the models on uh, these downstream tasks. However, um, it seems like the fused model um, that we sort of described earlier performs better than just a normal pre-training model on these grammatical tasks. And this increase in grammatical performance is of higher magnitude than um, other downstream tasks. Right, so now that we have some quantitative evidence for uh, this catastrophic forgetting theory, or this fact that, hey, maybe, maybe we're losing um, this fine-tuned, uh, this pre, uh, like this fine-grained grammar knowledge when we pre-train and then train on a high resource set, um, can, can we actually uh, qualitatively see these empirical observations? So I quickly ran over um, some examples. This is very like, this is still like sort of in progress. And uh, the, the examples that were responsible for the highest increases in blue sort of had something to do with um, omitting pronouns. So you're dropping who's, um, you're shifting tenses. You're sort of using grammatically incorrect word choices. Like, oh, I'd see why you use that word, but it's not exactly right. And like the gen, like there's weird like gender flips. Right, so I figured like a, a more like concrete example would probably be better here. Um, right, so with great technical effort, it is possible to conceal the metadata, et cetera, et cetera. So 
The fused model is the one where we sort of introduce BERT at the end. The naive pre-trained model is where we start off with BERT and catastrophically forget grammar. So for the fused model, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting because like the naive pre-trained one is technically correct. I mean, it, it like semantically, it's, it still sort of has the same meaning uh, as uh, fused. So it, it conveys the same meaning as the source sentence. However, there's a, there's a tense shift. Um, effort actually is efforts, is effort in the, in, in the fused model is correct. But in the naive pre-trained model, it shifts the tense to efforts. It makes it plural. Um, there's also a case where um, it kind of swaps communication with just message. So um, communication is slightly different, like using message, conceal metadata message so that it's not even, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as like grammatically, grammatically optimal. Semantically though, it, it's, it's right. All right, this is just um, summarizing what I said. Uh, the fused one uses singular male, the naive one uses a plural. Both are semantically correct, but the fused one is more grammatically close to the original source sentence. So there's, there, there are a few examples like, like this in the data set. Right, to summarize um, the conclusions, we know that NMT encoders, uh, or we think that NMT encoders are more data efficient representation learners. So they're better at uh, learning representations that perform better on downstream tasks with less data. However, these NMT encoders aren't good at fine-grained grammar tasks. And we think that naive pre-training uh, results in the NMT encoder losing its grammatical competence. However, if you use more careful fine-tuning methods at the end of your process, you can regain some of this competence. So fine-tuned methods like for NMT are a little more careful uh, but there's still some work to be done here. So grammatical error detection is still like a long shot away from BERT on the NMT encoders compared to other downstream tasks. In terms of future work, um, it, like there are more experiments to be done in terms of documenting like the rate of catastrophic forgetting of grammar. So maybe pausing the supervised model at like various epochs and probing for uh, this, the GED task is, uh, um, a good future step. There are definitely more thorough experiments to be done here. There's also a bit of a, um, uh, sorry, there's also a bit of a sidestep. Uh, the question is like, why is the, the decoder so bad? So I, I sort of glazed over this. I didn't really look at the decoder performance, but if you notice the decoder appears to do worse than a lot of these, a lot of the elements for a lot of the downstream representations. And like the, the question is why? So there is some pre-existing work that says, oh, if you use a deep encoder, so your encoder model that deals with like uh, your source language is deep and then you have a shallower decoder on the other end, uh, it doesn't really affect your blue score too badly. So the function of the decoder is still a little unclear. Um, and decoder representations also tend to get worse as you go deeper. So at the start, a decoder representation seems to do pretty well on downstream tasks, but as you move closer to the output, the, the representations get worse. So there still is this question mark for, uh, how is the decoder uh, affecting this grammar competence? And we're not sure. Right, uh, that's it, thank you. Thanks, Omar. Are there any questions? Again, feel free to just shout them out if you have any. Um, otherwise, I kind of have a question. So did you guys try fine tuning BERT, like maybe on some sort of translation data before giving it to like an NMT model? Um, right. Like it, it seems like that, like BERT might just be out of domain for a lot of translation data in the sense that sort of the objective doesn't match and like maybe the data doesn't match as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so basically by fine tuning, it may be if you can somehow fine tune BERT on like some sort of translation data and then use it in uh, an NMT system, you can sort of see if it really is just, if the catastrophic forgetting effect is still, um, it's still place, present or if it's just sort of out of domain. Um, mm -hmm. that yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, 
maybe we can uh, like concatenate like um, BERT embeddings with like uh, BERT English embeddings with BERT German embeddings and like train them on like this proxy task for translation and then use them as a, uh, a pre-initialization step for translation models to, to like help avoid this catastrophic forgetting problem. So yeah, in, in general, it seems like um, the, the, the problem here is if you have a lot of translation data for a, like you're, you're working in a resource, ri resource rich environment, um, the, the, the knowledge learned by the BERT embeddings is sort of like overwritten and wasted. Um, but yeah, that, 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 I, think, I think that's like a, a good uh, future, more thorough experiment next step. Just to be clear, Emily, it sounds like your suggestion is, it's simply that like, okay, well, the parallel data that was used to train the, the NMT model, maybe it's just different from what the BERT data is. So by fine tuning on there, or retraining on there ahead of time, it's just sort of, is that the idea? Like just make sure it's, it's had exposure to the domain ahead of time? Uh, yeah, and I think more than just the data itself, I think it's just the different languages. Like maybe I, maybe BERT isn't really exposed to that sort of both languages um, in the training data, mm -hmm. um, in, in sort of a translation context. Yeah, that that, that makes sense. I we, we did we did run into this peculiar problem. This is sort of a side experiment that I have time to cover, but um, we we actually fused BERT German to an English to German model. So in, in the context of these experiments I talked about, we fused BERT English to English to German. And um, we kind of hoped that like we were focusing on the encoder. So um, uh, in, in that scenario, the encoder was able to extract information from uh, the English model. Uh, but in the case of using BERT German for English to German, we didn't really notice anything, which is weird. So um, that's also sort of in the same, like maybe maybe there needs to be some kind of proxy task so we could better utilize BERT. Um, yeah. Any other well, questions? Well, one thing I was just occurring to me was, um, you know, we, we were talking before about ways to kind of uh, tease out whether the grammar uh, grammatical error detection is really the thing that you could take away from, from wh when you are successful with using uh, representations to enhance machine translation. And so I guess if you have um, a target language where the grammar isn't important, which I think is basically Chinese, there's no, basically no, it's the only, only language I think that has less inflection than, uh, than English. Um, so that could be uh, nice. Oh, oh. And if you, um, have a target language that has like a lot more inflection um, then and, and like you, you can see if you get a bigger gain in that case. Um, so try something like, like, I don't know if Turkish is really the right way to go there. Or maybe just, just, just go to a romance language and have this normal amount of inflection. Yeah, definitely good for next steps, which <laughs> we have a lot of. All right, then, if there are no other questions, then we'll conclude today's seminar. And thank you, Naitan and Omar, for speaking. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, everyone.